Awesome. So today we're sort of looking at two sort of subjects. We're looking at the social side and we're looking at the ethical side. So I guess just to kick it off, would love to just get uh, everyone's overview on the ethical side, sort of key concerns that you think, just throw them out and then we can kick off the dialogue from there. Sure. So it's great being here. This has been a great conference. An amazing, amazing day of a lot of knowledge being done. <laughs> so I really appreciate that. This, I, I think this is one of the things that, you know, a lot of people talk about the desert that's happening right now. And I think there's, there's a blind spot in that desert um, that it's not being addressed by many. It has been addressed by Hilgar there in a very wonderful and inspiring way that this medium is going to be the most powerful medium in the history of humankind. And it can change us, completely transform us as human beings and does so at the neurological level, and that, that science is there. So it's, you know, we can talk a little bit more about that later, but this, this idea that we just go blindly rushing forward like the Manhattan Project, uh, you know, into this new technology is, you know, I wonder what those scientists felt a few years later. And I think that that's going to hit us if we don't make this part of the ende endemic part of the discussion right now at the beginning. Let's not make the mistakes that Hollywood made at the beginning. Let's do this in a much more multidisciplinary way and really think about the ethical you know, ramifications. I've been a, actually a teller of cautionary tales about VR more than anything, even though it popularized it at the same time. So it's a bit ironic for me, but I, I, I'm incredibly excited about VR. I'm excited about making true interactive narrative story worlds. That's what we're doing at Virtuosity. Uh, but it's at the same time, I'm just as concerned that we, we really think about this up front before this becomes ubiquitous. So uh, that's, my, that's one of my focuses. Thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for having uh, the Virtual World Society join today. We were founded on the premise that uh, the intimacy of the virtual uh, world platform, be it VR or AR, uh, has great power in being able to transform people's lives. So to bring education uh, into the home in new ways, to be able to reconnect people uh, who may be you know, broken up families in different geographies. Uh, I wrote a piece recently about uh, the, the gig economy and perhaps reaching into refugee camps and being able to uh, give people uh, economic benefit as well as social benefit uh, via uh, virtual reality as, as a way of, uh, of connecting them back to the economy. Uh, and I think there's a lot of, uh, of that uh, capability that we are not addressing uh, very effectively. So one of the things that, you know, as much as we have the cautionary tales, uh, which I am uh, wholeheartedly in agreement because, as I said, this is a very intimate technology, as you alluded to. It's, it's at the neuron level. We are, we are literally touching the, the optic nerve, which is the doorway into the brain. Uh, the most uh, exposed nerve we have, uh, and, uh, and combining that with oral sensations, we have the ability to connect people both on a negative path, but also in a very positive way. Yeah. And so uh, our goal is to try to think about the, the positive ways, and also, uh, although we're a very new nonprofit and we're still finding our path, I think also to uh, kind of watch out for some of the ethics issues that may be arising uh, uh, from application. Uh, and uh, raising our hand and saying that's probably not the right way to go. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see, hopefully we'll have other people that are watching those behaviors as well. I think that uh, we're all here because we think virtual reality is very powerful and can create lots of amazing engagement and do a lot of very great things. I think the thing to realize too is that for every powerful and amazing experience that we have, it's also possible to kind of use that for bad. And I think it's really important to think about kind of those areas and how to make sure that we don't as a society promote those. And so in terms of ethical uh, problems in VR, I think there are kind of three main pieces that to me I think about the most. The first is violence, the second is trauma, and the third is what is kind of like identity theft or, you know, kind of avatars. Because at a certain point, you know, I could steal Taylor's avatar and punch it in VR, and that wouldn't make Taylor feel great. So I think there's a lot of different stuff in kind of those three categories for us to talk about and think about as a society and as a VR community. 
That's awesome. Thanks for having me. Um, I kind of got into VR um, doing consulting work with the UN, and uh, really, my focus is around impact. It just happened that VR is the best tool for that we have today. Um, just like these guys have said, it's an opportunity for us to manipulate people. It's the most effective manipulation tool we've got, and it used to be books for a long time. Uh, it's been plays and movies, uh, but now we have VR, and we have access, and we have Stanford researching how do we generate, how do we foster more empathy out of these virtual experiences? Are we going to hand over that blueprint, that roadmap for accessing humanity um, to the robots? And I, <laughs> so I think that's, you know, it, we're giving away those secrets. We're giving away the, the we're finding out, we're kind of unearthing um, the truths of what it is to be human, how to make those real connections through this medium. And, um, and we have a really, uh, it's, it's a really powerful tool, so we're, we, should be, you know, we should be gentle with how we hold that powerful tool. So I'm seeing there's sort of two sides to this as well. You've got the in VR ethical considerations, and then you have sort of how that actually transpires into the real world. And so something that most of you may have seen recently is this whole topic of harassment happening within VR. It's a very sensitive subject. Uh, someone actually felt like they had been groped in VR in a social experience, and that led to a lot of very interesting questions around how do you actually protect that space, how do you set standards, what kind of tools and mechanisms do you put into place to protect. Uh, some of the first things that have been done, like in the case that I'm mentioning, uh, in an experience called Quiver, you actually, as you're reaching toward the person, your hand starts to fade away, they see it fade away, and you start seeing a ghost-like image of a hand, and everyone in the space can see that as well, so it creates this sense of wow, this person is actually encroaching on my physical space here. So I'd be curious to know sort of how we should think about the laws and the regulations that apply in the real world and what actually comes into the virtual world and applies there as well. Hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, I think at first, look, there, all of us have drank the Kool-Aid and we're a lot of the time in, our, in this new industry, we're playing to our own room a lot. Uh, we don't have a lot of context for virtual experience in the actual public, except for things like the movies I made 20 some years ago. I still hear people you know, around the world think that that's what VR is. So we still have to set context. And so it's, 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 it's incumbent upon us as content creators, those of us that are really going out there to actually create an ethical framework that is at least a discussion. It's gonna be a living discussion. It's not gonna be rules and censorship because I, I, did, I don't believe in that at all. I think that VR can be you know, the greatest expression of human imagination ever. And I think, uh, you know, it can be actually the expression of any idea, including dangerous ones. But we have to have this as part of the discussion on an ongoing basis as part of the, in a sense, the ritual of the medium right from the beginning. One of the things that doesn't exist in this medium, it's such a powerful thing, is you know, we, we stand in a bread line at, uh, at exhibits and we throw on uh, the headsets and we go into this liminal state and it affects people, it affects our dreams, it affects well, how we see when we come out of it. It really is something that even in its most you know, rudimentary form affects us and we don't have uh, any kind of reverence for that yet. We need to actually put these things in place as part of what making content in VR is. You know, if, if you look at the way that films went out in the cinema, there was, a, there was a ritual that took place as cinema you know, was, was executed all over the world. And so, you know, that doesn't exist yet. And it, it's part of it because it's coming very strongly from the tech side first. That's where a lot of the oxygen is gone. And everyone wants just to push the tech. And that's, I think, fantastic. We want the tech to be pushed. But we need to slow that, this aspect of it down and realize, I think, even for the commercial uh, efficacy of, of true mass market VR, we've got to take these into, things into consideration. So I believe that one doesn't, you know, it's not mutually exclusive. And, and, and sort of talking about what those rules are, or at least that discussion right from the beginning should be part and parcel of what this entire industry is about from stage one. Absolutely, and I know, or, sorry, go ahead, Dan. No, I, I was just gonna say, I think one of the things we have to be cautious about, though, is uh, saying that we're not going to have censorship. Uh, from the standpoint of, uh, if we think about the ethical frameworks that we have in the world today, yeah. we make choices to opt into them, right? So if we're Christian or Jewish or Mormon, we opt into a framework. 
Uh, and within that framework, when we're in, you know, acting as a, a Jew or a Mormon, uh, we have certain standards that are written down and that there are certain expectations. Uh, and, and I think we have to think about that dialogue as being the, what's the dialogue in the virtual world that we're existing in versus the generic, right? The, the kind of just, you know, because I, I think there's actually a risk in having an overwhelming discussion that can be stifling yeah. if we make it too big. It's, you know, if we're in this space, what are the rules in that space? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult thing because then does VR become a religion? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the question. I'm not saying there's a specific answer to it. That's why right now, I mean, it, it, it could very easily move in that direction because it is literally a liminal state that we're going into that changes us, that can transform us. And what I've been looking at is the structure of VR being closer to tribal ritual than it is to almost any other medium. And so the, and there, are, there are rules around tribal ritual that, that guide people through. There's shamanic guidance in the context of tribal ritual from the beginning of time. And there's a reason for that because of what humans do and what we are at the reptilian brainstem level. So uh, I, I agree that that discussion has to be formulated, can't be chaos. Right, right. And that's, that's a, how to do that though, that's a real interesting question. And there may well be a religion that comes out of it, we don't know. I, yeah, I think to move into uh, that question, to me as a content provider, it, it really is on the people who are making the content to define the rules of the systems that they're creating. I mean, the amount of systems you create and experience are just exponential. So it really is on the content providers to make sure that the rules and the systems they create can't violate some of those ethical codes. And I think it's also then on the platform holders to make sure that you don't have content that does that. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I think having uh, some of these closed uh, ecosystems right now actually helps a lot to make sure that some of this bad stuff stays out of there and that it doesn't hit kind of you know, mass adoption and mass market. Uh, so I think two things. One um, for, and they're both sort of short-term solutions, I think, to the problem, which is, as you said, an ongoing conversation. But uh, one thing is around just having open source tools that developers can use and creators can use that allow for those sort of um, non-invasive interactions. Uh, so that seems like someone should get on that, and it would be in every single Vive game from now on. Um, so there's one. But I think sort of um, another strategy, which kind of what you said around the platform holders, it feels like there's a, a time in history when this happened in, in film, and when they started saying this is rated R, and this is NC-17, mm. and what those ratings meant, and what that board, of course that board is controversial, and those people have a lot of power, and those people sort of uh, make or break a lot of films. Um, but at the same time, it does give us um, a language that we can all understand. And we can all sort of opt into, I'm going to sign up my nine-year-old son, son or daughter for a, a rated R or a PG-13 film. I'll, I'll opt in to choose a little more dangerous. But having those parameters and having those parameters um, sort of accepted across all the big fish, all the big platforms, uh, that feels like a space where we could lean into and see if there's recommendations, even if it's a, sort of in that verification check space. Um, just like you become a lead certified company, you can be sort of a ethically driven VR content producer. So how does that evolve onto the web, right? Because when you're in a fully open platform like the web and you can literally have anything, you've got the, the dark web, right? Mm. What's happening there? What sort of frameworks can we put into place? Because you see now with kids have access to their tablet, they can literally search for anything, right? And when they're two years old, they can stumble across adult content, they can stumble across violent content. And so in VR, that's going to be so much more powerful and visceral that you know, it's really necessary, I think, to create some sort of solution to, to block that. And so you know, I think that sort of leads into the next topic of the social implications as they pertain to the actual real world. And so thinking about in the future, you know, sort of taking a slightly dystopian look, given the fact that this technology is so incredibly powerful and will have some negative effects, how do we actually, like, how do we imagine that future evolving and how do we start protecting ourselves from it now and start instituting rules, you know, thought processes, ways of onboarding people that try to avoid that? Well, I think one of the things that's missing right now and, and that will even address some of the, the business issues of getting adoption of VR is that there's not enough context being given to the medium for, for people that don't understand it yet, which is the vast majority of people. Uh, you know, I, I had a look, I did that a bit in the past with some of my films and giving some context for it and got very, a lot of people very excited. 
but that context, we have to take responsibility. Those of us that are leading the medium, those of us that are making content for this, we have to take responsibility to set that context from the beginning and not just blow past that. And, and I think storytelling and narrative is one of the most powerful things on the planet in order to set that to really tell stories that are self-reflexive to this medium that are about its positive, transformative uh, abilities and make that one of the focuses. Not every story can be that, obviously, but this is something that can be in, you know, endemic to the medium because I believe that this medium is about human transformation. One of the things that uh, you know, is, is one of the tropes out there is that you know, the, the world goes into this physical dystopia and then there's an uh, adoption of VR. I think the opposite of that can happen. I believe that VR can actually create a greater physical world. And there's ways that that, because of us being able to evolve ourselves, getting in touch more with aspects of ourselves that are creatively empowered in a way that a mass populace has never been creatively empowered before will lead to a better uh, expression in the real world of, of basically humanist principles. And that, those are the stories I want to tell, and I think those are stories that should be told in VR and about VR. I think one of the things we have to, again, be cautious a little bit about is on the social engineering side is the who gets to decide what good is, right? So when we talk about the films, that's an after the fact you know, rating, right? So we see the film, we go, oh, that's really obscene, or that's violent, and we'll put a, a score on that. When it's in the moment, right, so you mentioned the hand coming, how, how do I discern a hand groping someone from a haptic hug? Yeah. What's the, what, how, what, what is that cue that tells me that? And then who decides in that space what's good, right? And I think that's, again, going back to my earlier comments about the different ethical frameworks is that in some societies, things that are good are not considered good in other societies. Right. Yeah. And so is, is there, as you alluded to, is there a humanistic overarching discussion about the VRs, all, you know, that there's one framework or are different worlds governed by different rules, right? I think that's a discussion that has to be. It's, it's a discussion. It's a discussion, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, as, as far as like the opportunity for us to really get in and get in front of some of these problems um, to make sure that people have the most robust experience possible, we can really, um, you know, be mindful as everyone is saying up here, but also put forth, like someone needs to write the paper. We need to have a rule, uh, someone to start the conversation and to put it in right. And that will get shared. That will be a kind of place where people can then shift and mold and move and find a glossary to start from. I think we're kind of, there's a void of that at the moment um, beyond maybe the VR book and a few other resources. Uh, there's a very limited, especially a two-way street conversation, maybe the subreddit of Oculus. But that, it, that's like a big place where we need to have a starting point. And maybe we can commit at this table, at this panel, at this event, that we all need to get in front of that conversation. We all, it's sort of on us all to start that conversation. And we should look at where are the megaphones, where are people spending time, where are people getting their information in VR, and seeing, okay, how do we position that person, or that institution, or that body, um, or company into a place where they're gonna kind of set the, the glossary, set the jargon, set the tone um, for people to pick sides around. I think that you know, one of the things that I'm very much looking out for, and I think a lot of kind of people in the VR industry are looking at, is when the first lawsuit happens. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really going to define not only the rules, but also looking at you know what what can and can't happen in VR. So um, there's a case that I think was uh, Brown against the merchants, uh, the Electronics Merchants Association, that was in California about. Uh, violent video games, and that California said that uh, if you're under 18, you couldn't buy a violent video game, and that was overruled. That was start passed in 2005. It was overruled in 2011. And I think we're going to start to see this legal precedent that starts to catch up and say that you know, hey, maybe VR is something a little bit different than a video game. And I think if we don't do kind of that ethical standard as a community, eventually it's going to happen via regulation. So I've, I've started to throw a few things out there. Um, I, I, I was inspired by Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics, which he wrote in a fictional context for a robot detective series. And so uh, for a project that I'm uh, developing with uh, HBO producer Rob Weiss called The Futurist, 
I wrote my five laws of ER, or character. And again, I firmly, you know, not the, the word law is extremely loose here, and it's in a fictional context. Uh, it's out there, published, you guys can look at it. I'm not gonna go over them all, but uh, they're, they're very much focused on the humanist position. And I'm also, I'm announcing right here now, I'm, I'm starting something called the Global Human Movement. Uh, and basically it's about the fact that I believe, my fifth law of VR is that VR must be the medium of the global human. Not global citizens, just humans. Where we can express ourselves as humans with none of the prejudices, with none of the boundaries, with none of the barriers. And I got this idea from a man named Joseph Campbell that I sat with in a mineral tub at Esalen 37 <laughs> years ago. I snuck in, I was a young man, I snuck in with my partner at the time, and it turned out that Joseph Campbell was in that tub. And I asked him, <laughs> what mythology should I follow as a storyteller? Because I had done nothing at that point. So, and he said to me, it's the mythology of the global human. It's the final mythology we need to address on this planet. And uh, I didn't even understand what he meant until just recently with becoming involved with TrueVR. One, what are the five? <laughs> well, the first one is take VR seriously. The stakes are high. Do not underestimate the virtual world's of, uh, ability to affect the actual world. There you go. That's the first one. Um, I think to your real question about like kind of the dark web and the, the openness of the internet and what that allows for people's imaginations and allows people to take action in, in all sorts of ways, negative and positive. I think a lot of people look to VR as finding a solution as sort of like when we work with the UN, what's the solution to the Syrian refugee crisis? Can we solve that with VR? No, <laughs> we can't solve the problem. We can't, that's not what VR is going to do. It's not going to solve the fact that people make bad choices on the internet. We can't, we can't limit that. I think it's more about um, you know, leveraging what the solutions that exist in the world, the solutions we all sign up, sort of signed up for or know about. We can get there quickly maybe with VR. We can get there efficiently, but we're not going to invent the solution through VR. I, don't. I think VR can, can magnify and amplify the better angels of our nature. And because it's about communication and there's an intimacy to it, which is completely, I think, endemic to the, to the medium. And that, that is an amazing opportunity. We've never had that before. So yeah, of course, it's not going to solve the Syrian refugee crisis, but human communication eventually can solve everything. Mm -hmm. So, yep. uh, but amongst our own species anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that aspect of VR, I think, is very, very hopeful. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm skeptical uh, because having people in the room together having a discussion is, is also, a, it's, that's a, it's a great way to solve problems too, and, yeah. and our diplomats and, and leaders don't necessarily do that as well, so I'm not sure having a, a new channel that allows, you know, and perhaps, and perhaps it's the scale issue, right? So that, yeah. that room where they have all the politics, and, and I think one of the things that, that we need to think about on the ethical side of, of VR is what does co-creation look like, right? So yeah. it's not that you know, I, I do worry about social engineering and who gets to pick what good is, but there's also the side which is a, a much more representative democracy view, which is how do we co-create that yeah. for whatever space we're talking about. You know, we, we do a lot of work in diversity and inclusion uh, in VR and uh, helping people kind of step inside the shoes of those with diverse backgrounds, maybe adverse backgrounds, and um, one, of the, one of the kind of missing things in that conversation is around the technology gap around communities that are underserved and don't have access, not just to the hardware and, and access to buy games and these experiences, but also access to just the headlines. Yeah. Like they're kind of missing, you know, there's underserved communities in America today that are missing out, that they don't even know about VR. You know, and I think- It's economic determinism in this, in this, in this medium right now, completely. And that's, yeah. that's yeah. something that has to change. So I think adding those sort of voices and those communities to the conversation, providing access points, using public libraries, using um, places where those communities are already getting their media, how do we you know, put, our, put our kind of marker into their space, into their feeds, if you will? Yeah, but not just a voice, actually greater creative empowerment, because I believe the addictive aspect of this medium, even from the most commercial standpoint, is creative empowerment. We can creatively empower people in an almost seamless way with where this technology is going, and there's something about that that raises the communication, that raises the, the, the things that can be addressed and discussed. Again, I'm sort of a cockeyed optimist about it. I'm also terrified. You know, most of the films I made about it are terrifying. So I'm, I'm definitely in a, 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 a dichotomy, 
but I truly believe that there, there's an, uh, an option here that if we keep the discussion going, that it can move in that direction. And if that becomes the thing that's really successful, if creative empowerment in any virtual space, metaverse, gaming, interactive VR narrative becomes a central tenet of this medium, I think that that will inherently rise its, its purpose and its use. It's one of the reasons I encourage developers to build toolkits for people, because I think the, uh, I do a lot of work with libraries, and so they are buying headsets, et cetera, but as we know, there's a lot of demo software and not a lot of things to empower people to do, right. and, and at the same time, the makers are also moving into the libraries, and I think the VR community needs to meet the maker community so to much. build tools that allow people to build things in VR as well. I think that's that's a, a one of the place we have to one of the big problems Hollywood has with VR. I think is you know Hollywood thinks we are the storytellers and we bring you the stories and you sit there and watch them, and that posture is in every room and every meeting in Hollywood. Believe me, I've been there a lot. So it's and that is so different than what this is. That's why the gaming community I think understands this much more organically. But that that cultural thing because VR is not that. And it will never be that in a way that I think will be truly successful. And so um, I think that's a good thing because it forces people, if they want to actually succeed in this medium, you've got to embrace this entire other rubric. I think the conversation you're having about access is, is very apt. I mean, we look at you know, underserved communities and the things that they get to do. And I think a lot of the most powerful stories that I've seen in VR generally come from people who don't have that kind of experience. I was at um, an event last week, uh, an, an event about VR that was used for uh, Ocean uh, Conservancy. And uh, there was a really powerful story about uh, a fisherman from the Philippines who had been taught about conservation, and now he was a conservationist in the oceans protecting it for his children. And those kinds of stories are the ones that really kind of hit that chord, that you really look at and say, you know, wow, this is kind of what the medium is built for. And I think empowering more of those stories to kind of come up and to support those really helps you know, kind of the, the global push for good that this technology can have. And at the same time, it's also making sure that we don't support the ones that are, are doing terrible things. I mean, it, it really is, you know, important that developers and the community says, no, this isn't good and this shouldn't happen. And it, it's really amazing to, to think about, you know, some of the, the stuff that has happened and not everyone has said, okay, duh, don't do that. And, and it, it doesn't come from just the, the people at the top, it has to come from the whole community so that you know, we can kind of guide or push content creators away from doing the, the terrible stuff that you were talking about earlier. Yeah, one of the big players, I think, in that sort of uh, promoting the VR for good and sort of fostering that would be Oculus and their VR for good program. I think it's really kind of a signal um, to the whole community when it comes from Oculus that they just put $10 million fund together for VR for good. I mean, we should all see that as a big signal in the, no uh, in the noise. And I think, you know, I mean, Upload, you guys have an awesome VR for good stuff going on. Um, I know the two projects that came out of that uh, competition were awesome. Um, one is around uh, better understanding for teachers uh, with students with dyslexia. And the other is around fitness and sort of fighting obesity through uh, virtual gaming and serious gaming. And um, just those sort of, sort of, from the big fish, from those that, that feed all of uh, the development of new content creation, I think that's where, you know, that we can see that support, we can see that support shine, um, and, and where they say like, oh, we're only gonna be supporting VR for good projects. If you have a general VR project, that's great too, but we're, our fund is for this. I was also very happy to see uh, the Google Expeditions project. I thought that was a really uh, great way to say, you know, hey, let's put VR in the hands of, of underserved kids. And the thing that made me so happy about that is I had a high school friend who's a teacher in a really underserved community in Chicago. And literally on Facebook, she posted pictures of her kids using that. And that's the powerful stuff that kind of like makes me warm and fuzzy on the inside and makes me really happy to see that out there in the world. And for just $36 a year, you can join the Virtual World Society <laughs> and create your own fund and help us direct where that goes. So. And if you want to join the Global <laughs> Human Initiative, reach out to me on Facebook, Brett Leonard. So I just got the five minute warning, but I will ask one more tough question for the sake of progress today uh, that you can sort of ruminate on as we take questions from the, the audience is what, from each person, what's the one rule 
that you would want to put in place now that you think would protect us most in the future? Hmm. And so I'll sort of direct it out to the audience now for questions. Uh, should I answer that? Yeah. I think we can probably answer it at the end. Yeah. Tom Fuller from YouGov. Um, all today we've heard uh, speaker after speaker talk about co-creation and, and the power of interaction and, and what the community can build in there. I'm, con I'm wondering, um, especially when you talk about underserved communities and things like that, what happens to the IPR of something that is created within a virtual space? Who owns something that is persistent within a virtual world that is created by one of the users? And how do they get compensated? How do they get uh, rewarded for this? There's going to be new law written. There's going to be new boiler. There's none of the boilerplate that exists works and, and for this. And it's a huge area. And I think that really the legal community hasn't really jumped in yet. Um, and, and it needs to, because that, I think that is a massive question. The first lawsuit, again, will define that. Um, it, it's whoever makes the content, it's completely up in the air. So until someone sues someone else and there's an actual legal definition, I don't think we're going to have an answer. And, and I think it extends all the way down, because if we talk about the intimacy, uh, you know, one of the things that I look at is, literally, is eye tracking. Uh, and what's going to happen when, you know, you, your eye is looking at something and stereotypically that uh, data is sent to somebody that you haven't approved, right? And, and that's going to happen and it's going to be a first, another, you know, there will be multiple first lawsuits. Uh, but that, it's all yeah. doom and gloom here. Tonight. Yeah, yeah. But no, but I think, but that's, that's the, that's, that's America, right? I mean, or Britain or wherever. That's the world, in, in, in litigious societies, it's the lawsuits that define what the frameworks are, right? I was part of a, a, the Toronto code that Dr. Steve Mann, the father of a wearable computing, we did it at the VRTO in Toronto, called the Toronto Code, which is about uh, code of ethics for human augmentation and virtuality. And it's about being able to know what that data that's going to be coming out of your interaction with any of these kinds of technologies is really, be, when it's be, being uh, seen, any, any, there, there's a thing in it, a clause in it that's about if, if you get delayed feedback about what's happening, that's feedback delayed is feedback denied. I mean, it's a very, very powerful thing that Steve Mann was working on for 25 years and we ratified it uh, just this last summer. So that, that's the kind of stuff that needs to happen in the community and at least you know, stimulate this discussion. Yeah, I think um, there in, the, uh, in that space, just about ownership and IP, you know, I look at a few different kind of existing models and um, everything from kind of when you upload your video to YouTube, uh, and, and that sort of like, we know that YouTube has made no, no actual profits. Uh, so that whole system, that model of we're gonna have advertising across a lot of eyeballs and who owns that piece of content, and how do they make money and how do you share it with the platform? And so I think today we kind of have moved past that model. We know that model is a little broken and the math doesn't quite add up yet. Um, so I think that's one place, whereas there's that opt-in model of the Behance of instead of making my artwork for Tumblr, I'm going to make my artwork and put it in an ecosystem where I can make money. Um, so that is a sort of like, let's say instead of Tilt Brush, I'm going to go into Tilt Brush Pro and someone can buy my art instead of in Tilt Brush, it will just be given to the community. Hi, um, my name is Marty Martin and I'm a filmmaker and I come from a background of escapism. And at its best, escapism leads to transformation. Mm -hmm. And I think that VR certainly has that capacity. But I also think that before we talk too much about rules, we should be considering things like how a medium like film can affect people, which we don't take into account often enough. But also things like we have, you know, I have an iPad, I have an iPhone. We all have the, a device already that can transform the world, that can connect us, and we choose for it to be more of an exclusive experience where we detach from the world. That's a really huge concern of mine. I'm just curious to see you know, your perspectives on how can VR bypass that? Because I think that's outside of rules at this point. I think that's a huge ramification with how we're treating technology now and how we expect something like VR to all of a sudden be this new format that we're gonna treat differently. It won't be. <laughs> just all of a sudden, we need to, we need to actively take the platonic responsibility as creators to push it in that direction. 
in my day job, I'm a scenario planner. So I think about, and, and I think all of these questions are in the realm of uncertainty at this point. We have not made the choice yet uh, of what the answer to that question is. So all of those possibilities still exist about are we going to do it ethically or non-ethically, or is it going to be open or closed? And I, there's all kinds of possible futures for VR. Uh, and, and I think part of this discussion is the how do we start thinking about how those variables find a value? Uh, and, uh, but we haven't done that yet. I, I would answer with, I think you have to think about what virtual reality is apt for and what it's not. Same with other devices and other mediums. If you can't answer the question of why you're building it for VR, I don't think you should make it. So like that I think is the core essence of you know, building stuff for VR is that it has to be made for it. And that means that some genres fall off. Like for instance, I don't think comedy works great in VR because you can look around and it's all about timing. But it, it means like maybe wait a few years and see the other rules that are invented before that. Um, I think uh, there's, well, let me uh, just say, I think that I really love what kind of your idea of using VR to allow people to be better in real life. Yeah. So my worst fear is that Netflix and HBO makes these awesome shows in VR that are eight episodes long and then you stay inside all day for eight hours, and you watch that VR experience, you do that, you live in that world, and then you eat dinner and you go to bed. What a terrible world that would be. That's We're already horror. doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I know that's happening. That is a, I think we should be standing in front of that. People need to say, that's not healthy. That will not be healthy for the world, not be healthy for our children, for the future. I think what we could do is look at VR and say, here's a use case, the app use case, Maybe we're going to optimize humans. After 15 yeah. minutes of making decisions in VR, having choices, seeing the outcomes of those choices, having some sort of Cortana guide walk you through, oh, I noticed you made that choice. Let's, let's talk about that. What if we retrace our steps to see if we get a different outcome? Those sort of opportunities for, are really where VR, I think, where VR shines. There, there's significant research that proves that it can address other aspects of the brain functioning that have never been addressed by any other behavioral technique in history. Uh, Dr. Skip Rizzo and his work at uh, USC with, uh, with uh, PTSD, uh, it's the most successful behavioral therapy ever because it address gets past the resistance of the limbic system and goes to deeper levels of the brain and actually does rewire neuronic pathways. Now that also means the responsibility, the stakes are high. I, I would argue, though, that if you look at the commentaries around, for instance, Luke Cage, people binge watch Luke Cage, but there's a lot of social impact that that series has generated in terms of race relations, and uh, and I think that's that has a powerful, yeah, yes. Could we, could we have a more powerful discussion elsewhere, perhaps? Yeah. But I, you know, I don't think that 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 there's an inherent negativity to that behavior if it leads to something that's positive, right? So I think it's the how we actually take that consumption and what we do with it that's important. It's on all of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's on those of us that want to be story worlders. It's on us. Cool, guys. Well, that takes us to the end. So who wants to go first? Uh, I'll go. Uh, we're kind of building a manifesto at our, at our company right now. And the first rule is that the audience is the most important, and we design and develop and think for the audience. We put ourselves in the shoes of the audience, and we think about what would the audience want. Um, I, when I was at Discovery Channel, and we were doing a lot of VR work, often people would say, well, let's put this camera on the nose of the skateboard. Well, the audience does not want to put their face next to the asphalt. Um, they would say, what if we put the camera on the side of this big, dig, sort of like shovel, and it's up in Alaska, it'll be great. People will go and be next to this like scene. No one wants to put their face right next to the shovel of a big dig rig. So the, we really uh, make a point to all the content we work on and all the, the projects we work on in VR are around audience first. I would say the one rule that I would definitely think about is that if you're designing an experience, think that people might break the golden rule, which is do unto others as you would want to be done on. Make sure you plan that people aren't like that and you don't give them the opportunity to kind of destroy that. And that's exact. I was going to use the Jewish version of that, which is Rabbi Hillel saying, do not do to others what you do not want done to you, which I don't know if you know there's a difference, but there is. <laughs> uh, and, and the rest is commentary. So that was his uh, summary of uh, the, uh, the Talmud. 
in the Torah. But I would also add, just facetiously, that uh, we have to stop making bad 360 video with bit. <laughs> it just makes people ill. We Don't get me stop. on that. Oh, have God. To stop <laughs> <laughs> Word. Uh, and I just think that creative empowerment, really, really allowing people to fully express their imaginations in concert with true interaction with each other as just humans, global humans. That's, that's, that's what I believe is, is the, 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 the foundation of what this medium should be about. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.